Before our service begins, could we, would you please join me in a word of prayer? Uh, let's pray together. Gracious God, may we hear your voice today. As we sing and pray and take in your word, may we know that you are speaking to us with love and grace, and may we speak these same things to those around us as we leave. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. We begin worship this morning with the call to worship followed by the hymn of praise, Open My Eyes That I May See, found on page 454 of the United Methodist Hymnal. Let us unite our voices as we worship. Happy are those who live in the house of the Lord, those who ever sing your praise, O God. Happy are those whose strength is in you. Let us worship the God of our salvation. Let us praise the name of the Lord.
Please join in the responsive reading of Psalm 84 as printed in your bulletin. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it sings, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. O Lord of hosts, my ruler and my God, at your altars even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of tears, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield and bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed are those who trust in you. As we come to our prayer time this morning, uh, I would like to draw your attention to the concerns listed in your bulletin um, and make special uh, mention of Alice Kilgrove's mother, uh, Betty Fincher, on her death recently. Um, and let's also remember those who've been affected by the rains and flooding in our area last night and keep them in our prayers today and throughout this week. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we do first pray for those in our community today and close to us whose lives have been interrupted by the weather. Be with them and may you allow us the opportunity to serve as your people and the church to provide care and comfort for those who need it. We are grateful to you this morning that you have given us an example as you teach us how to live and that you walk with us each step. And when we cannot see beyond our current circumstances, when we are confused and fearful about our future, when we seem at a loss, you are still with us, reminding us of days of hope and love and a future of abundant life. When we are neglected and feel alone, when we make choices that push people close to us away, you remind us that we are your children and the recipients of your unconditional love and grace. We thank you that you have taken us as your beloved we yearn to be a loving people, a people who are known by our love for you and our love for our neighbors. And we know that there are so many around us in need of your love and presence. Each week we carry with us a list of your precious people in need. We carry with us those in our own lives in need. We have places in our lives desperate for healing Please hear these needs of our hearts in these moments as we lift them up to you. We pray that you heal our relationships. And we do pray for those whose lives have been interrupted by current situations. May we fulfill our call to be a source of healing and comfort. We seek to be a loving church. Set us right when we are wrong, but when we are faithful, give us the strength to keep going, to share love, to live gracefully and with faithfulness, with forgiveness in our hearts, and with the understanding that all people belong to you and deserve the goodness that you have shared with us. We offer our prayers in the name of your Son, Jesus, who's taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we invite our ushers to come forward, um, I would let you know that at the end of our prayer of dedication this morning, after our offering, I would invite all of our our kids down um, to the front for our children's moment with Miss Shannon. May we find joy in our giving this morning as we return a portion of what we have received. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow with ceaseless praise, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee, swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee, filled with messages from thee. Take my will and make it mine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee.
God of grace, may we always remember that you are a God of infinite goodness. As you hold us up, may these gifts support your church and the work you call us to do. May your blessings be seen in their use, and may you know of our gratitude through our giving. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our children are invited to come forward, and at the conclusion of our children's moment, I would invite you to stay seated as we sing number 2130 in the faith we sing the summons. Good morning. It's got the summer sludge going slow. Come on, come on. Oh, not Brody. Here he comes. That's right. That's my boy. Come on. Come on. Good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? Good. Doing well? Got lots of folks who are getting ready to go back to school soon, right? Two more weeks. Got some people up here who are going to start school for the first time. Are you excited? Yeah. You excited, Brody? Yeah. You can sit right there on the floor. You don't have to sit on the steps. Well, sometimes when we get started back to school, we have to go and do like, you know, get our physicals and stuff like that, right? So have you ever had to go to get your vision checked? I see a few people here with glasses. So I always have to wear like these, right? These are readers. But underneath these readers, I wear these. You know what these are? Yeah, they're contacts. And I had to start wearing glasses when I was in third grade. I had the coolest big plastic frame glasses. No, you don't think so? Okay. <laughs> so you've had that experience before, right? You've gone to the doctor to get your vision checked. Well, sometimes we have to have a spiritual vision check. Have you ever heard of that before? Does that make sense? Spiritual vision check. So, did you know that in the Bible, King David, who was also the David that was like the guy, hey, come on, come on. He was also the little boy that defend, like defeated over uh, Goliath. Do you remember that story from the Bible? Yeah. Well, he, do you remember that one, Bristol? He asked God, he shouted out and said, please help me with my vision. He cried out, I mean, it was a little bit more, you know, extensive than that. But he was basically saying, God, please help me correct my vision. And do you think he was meaning like blurriness, like so he could see words better on the page or blurriness of pictures out far or trees? No? What do you think he was asking? Um, what did I say? That he could know right from wrong? Uh, I think so. I think you're right. So he was saying, please help me see things clearer through you. He wasn't just asking God to help him with that clear blurriness. He was asking God for spiritual vision check. And sometimes we have to do that, okay? And um, so we have to ask. Here's a question we have to ask, okay? We need to ask, it, what is what I'm doing in my life about God's glory and grace? You want to say that with me? Repeat that. I'm going to be, you be my echo. Say glory and grace. Yeah, that's pretty easy. So with whatever you're doing, when you go back to school and you're making choices and things you have to do throughout your day and with friends and new classmates, say, is this, a, is this through glory or grace? Say it again. Glory and grace. We have to ask ourselves those sometimes. And sometimes we have to squint, right? We have to go, hmm. Have you ever done that when you're thinking? You'll go, hmm. Is this the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? Have you ever done that before, Palmer? Yeah. You did that too, Brody? Sometimes I do that every day. So just like going to the eye doctor, spiritual vision checks are not like a one and done thing. You don't just do it one time. We have to do it all the time, almost every day, okay? We must constantly put on our God glasses. So let me show you. I think God glasses look like sunglasses. What do you think? Why not, right? Can you see yourself in these glasses? Can you see yourself in them? Well, that's what you want God to do. If you meet Jesus, if you ever met Jesus, I know I would want him to be able to see his reflection in me. Would you want him to see his reflection in you? Yeah. That means the things that you do and you say, and so he doesn't have to squint to find himself in you. How do you think? How do you think that is? Do you think that's a good idea? Yeah. You want him to have clear vision and be able to see himself in you. So can we have a little prayer? What do you think? Because we're going we're gonna to have lots of fun things going on the next couple weeks. And then our year is going to start back. So let's take a deep breath. 
Remember during VBS, we'd stop, we pause for a minute, we can close our eyes if we want to, try to focus ourselves. Dear Lord, help us to see you more clearly. Remind us to wear our God glasses so that we may see the world through your eyes. Amen. Thank you. All right, let's go to Children's Church. You ready? Okay, I better put these back on or I won't be able to see. <laughs> scripture is from the fifth chapter of Joshua, verses 10 through 15. The Israelites camped in Gilgal. They celebrated Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month on the plains of Jericho. On the very next day after Passover, they ate food produced in the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped on that next day when they ate food produced in the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. So that year they ate the crops of the land of Canaan. When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up. He caught sight of a man standing in front of him with his sword drawn. Joshua went up and said to him, Are you on our side or that of our enemies? He said, Neither. I'm the commander of the Lord's heavenly force. Now I have arrived. Then Joshua fell flat on his face and worshipped. Joshua said to him, what is my master saying to his servant? The commander of the Lord's heavenly force said to Joshua, Take your sandals off your feet, because the place where you are standing is holy. 
So Joshua did this. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. so weary when troubles come and my heart burdened be then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me you raise me so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. When I am down and oh so weary, when troubles come and my heart burn and be, then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me. me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. than I can be. Well, good morning, beloved. It's wonderful to see you in worship this morning. Is there a word from the Lord? I certainly hope so. I've been asking that all week. That's our question from the Bible this week. Is there a word from the Lord? And I found it 
a passage to really struggle with, that's a great big question. And so as we ponder that together, uh, will you pray with me? Oh, great God, you meet us here and we encounter you in so many different ways. Through the reading of scripture, through prayer, through music, through proclamation and response. And we anticipate meeting you here this morning. We pray that you will communicate with us and guide us in such a way that we may walk the path that you set before us to be a godly people. And so come, Lord, speak for your servants are listening. In the name of Christ. Amen. So did you come this morning expecting a word from God? Some communication, some guidance? That's an awesome thing, isn't it? When your feet hit the floor this morning, did you jump out of bed saying, I'm ready to hear a word from God? I know Rob did. That's an awesome thing. So how can we have that expectation? And how does it happen? One of my favorite writers through the years was a Lutheran pastor from Evanston, Indiana, His name is Walter Wangren. He had a way of storytelling that was wonderful. He served a Lutheran church in the city called Grace Lutheran. And he wrote a book called The Chronicles of Grace. And he tells lots of stories in that book, but one of the main characters in his church, in his stories, is Miss Lill. Miss Lill is a matriarch of the church. And so after Walter had been there a while, he noticed every Sunday when Miss Lil exited worship and shook his hand, she had one of two responses to the sermon. Sometimes she would say, Ooh, you sure did teach today. And then other days she would say, Whew, you sure did preach today. Teach, preach. Those were the two responses. And so it created... This question in Walter's mind, what is the difference? How, why the different responses? You ever taught, either taught today or you preach today? So one day he was visiting with Miss Lil in her home. And he said, Miss Lil, you know, you, you say these two things to me. What's the difference? What makes the difference? And Miss Lil, she pondered that a moment. And she was very deliberate in her answering. She said, well... When you teach, you give me something to study, to ponder, to pray about. And I come home and I read my Bible and I study. And she paused a minute and then her eyes got wide. And she leaned in, her voice deepened. She said, but when you preach, God is here. God is here. And so is there a word from the Lord? That was basically the question that Joshua asked all those ages ago. He was standing on the vast plain of Jericho. After a long sojourn, a long journey in the wilderness. And finally, 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 God's promise was being fulfilled, and they crossed that river Jordan into the promised land. But it was a hard, long journey. 
They had wandered around in the desert. God had provided manna. And it's so easily missed in the text. But in the text it said when they crossed over, this is the land of milk and honey, a land of abundance. And God had finally let them cross over. And they ate food from the land. That meant that they no longer had to be sojourners. They no longer had to scrounge around for the manna. Even though it was a gift from God, this was a whole new day. A whole new beginning. It's interesting, the passage says that the men of war had all died off. Joshua had a covenant ceremony before they entered into this new land, this new beginning with new possibilities, a renewing of the covenant. And so their sights were set on passing the faith forward to new generations, a new life in communion with God. They set their sights on moving forward. And so standing there on that piece of promised dirt, The promised land, Joshua saw this figure approaching. And he hollered out, are you friend or foe? The man had a sword. It didn't take long to figure out. He announced himself, this is the messenger of God. And so Joshua asked the question, what does the Lord say to his servants? In this moment. Is there a word from the Lord. Right now. And the response he gets. Is the word of the Lord. The messenger. Says take off your shoes. You are standing on holy ground. And Joshua. Even when the messenger had come. And he announced himself. Joshua had fallen to his knees. In awe of God. And the messenger was saying. Basically God. Is with you. And you will. Move forward. So worship God and God alone. Be devoted to God and God alone. And let your life. Reflect that. That you are dedicated to the God. Of your deliverance. You bet, there is a word from the Lord. And you're to move forward with that word. And so, can and does God communicate to us that clearly today? As you read your Bible, as you study in groups, as you pray, as we come to worship, does God speak? Does God lead? And how? Do you discern that God is here and that God speaks to us? An old mentor of mine said, you have to wrestle with the scripture until a message comes. And I have been wrestling. This is a huge question. Is there a word from the Lord? And how do we know? How do we know it's accurate? How do we know it's true? I think about the broken vessels that we are as messengers, as proclaimers of God's word, standing here at the holy desk. When I was a preacher boy, I just kind of bumbled and stumbled into this role. And I've told this story in a Sunday school class. As a student at Lambeth College, I was sent out to this little church in Chester County. And I always had my sermon on cards. It was organized. Introduction, point one, two, three, poem, prayer, boom. That was the message. Well, about the third Sunday, I'd only preached about five times. This was the third Sunday at this little church. I got my cards all mixed up. So that was very disturbing. Was that a word from the Lord? Could Could God work through that? My jumbled up little index cards. And so, this is a big question. Joshua's question is still with us. So, Joshua communicated with God before there was a sacred text down in writing. It was an oral tradition. 
And so think about that. Before the written word, there was the word of God, the voice of God. When we read scripture as we did today, we say the word of God for the people of God. We refer to our Bible as the word of God. How is this sacred text? There are other religions, religious traditions, they have sacred texts. Are their sacred texts true? As we think of our text as being true. And how do we know? How do we measure that? Gauge it? Well, here's a very short answer to a very complex question. We know this is the word of God because through it we hear the voice of God. We know that this sacred text reflects the divine nature and purpose of God. And so it reveals to us the history of God's grace and truth. And best of all, that grace and truth was embodied in the flesh by Jesus. And so God's own beloved son became the living text. So we have sacred text, we have Jesus. But then how does Jesus and how even does this sacred text speak the word of God to us today? How does God communicate the living word to us right now, right here, teaching us and guiding us and eliciting a response from us every day? How does that happen? Well, these are the questions I've been struggling with and wrestling with out of this one question. Is there a word from God? What does the Lord have to say to his servants in this moment? Well, after wrestling with that really for years and weeks in this particular message, here's what I've come to, and I hope it is meaningful. For this holy text to become the living word in this moment for us to communicate and guide us as guidance from God, a convergence has to happen. At least three things have to converge for even this sacred text to become the word of the Lord for us in this moment. Three things at least have to converge. First is the sacred text. We reference this as the voice of God in text. And so you have the text. You must have the convergence of the Holy Spirit, our companion, our guide, our tutor. So somehow the Holy Spirit must interpret the text and it must address our current situation, our context. So that's the convergence that has to happen. Scripture, Holy Spirit, and our current circumstances. And when that happens, God speaks. Still, even today. But it takes those three things. When that happens, there is illumination. And even God inhabits this moment. That's how we recognize that God is speaking. God is here. God is guiding. God is leading us into his future. God is calling us to respond now in a specific way. As faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. And so there is illumination. There is understanding. And God is here. God inhabits the text that becomes a living text. And God inhabits this moment. And we encounter God here. Did you notice our first hymn? Uh, we sing it all the time. Open my eyes that I may see. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready my God thy will to see. Open my ears, my eyes, my heart. Illumine me. Spirit divine. So the sacred text. The work of the Holy Spirit in our present moment and context 
It can illuminate. But best of all, God can inhabit this moment, this place, and speak. And so the question becomes, are we hearing? Are we responding? Are we living as people of God? Walter Brueggemann is about the smartest biblical scholar that I read and follow. And he says there are two competing stories. One is the story of the world. And that story of the world tries to define who we are and what our relationships are and how life might go for us. But he says that story is untrue. It will deceive you every time. The story of the world. It is the story of living east of Eden in all of the deception, all of the self-destructive urge. He says that's the story of the world. But there's an alternative story. It is the story of God. And it's not just limited to the sacred text, a historical text, stories from the past, Joshua crossing over the Jordan. It's not just limited to the past. It is present. It is future. And God illuminates. God inhabits the story. And the point is that God rewrites the story of the world. God rewrites our story. And so, as God tells God's story... Even in this very moment, then what happens is, again, there is the convergence. God is rewriting, and we get to co-author the story. So there's a progression. Rigamon says, God's story, our story that's be, being rewritten by God. And then beyond that, there are new possibilities and new practices that are required. When the living word speaks, when God speaks, communicates, guides, illumines, inhabits the moment. God speaks and tells God's story, rewrites our story. But then the rest of the story is what are we going to do with that? There are always new possibilities. There are always new practices that we are to do in response to the word of the Lord. That's our challenge. If we are hearing the word of God proclaimed in this moment by the miracle of God's grace and truth and spirit, there is the call to be people of God when you walk out those doors. And if we don't do that, God's communication is incomplete. And so long ago, Joshua asked, is there a word from the Lord? What does the Lord say to his servants in this moment? And the messenger said, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. And because you have encountered me and heard me, now go live as people of God. Miss Lil said, sometimes you teach. But when you preach, God is here. And so as your pastor, I pray for all of us that there will be illumination when these things converge the text the Holy Spirit the very voice of God speaking when these things converge and God meets us here and speaks to our circumstances may there be illumination may, may there be understanding but more than that May there be appropriate, faithful response in your life. Because God is telling the true story. And we are co-authors. 
we get to help write the story. We get to participate. And so in doing so, we find that God inhabits the story. And we meet God here. So may it be so for us. Is there a word from the Lord? I hope we anticipate that. I hope by the grace and truth of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, that's what's happening here. As we gather and we study this sacred text, this authoritative text, I hope it inhabits us by how we live every day. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, there is always a challenge as we end worship. We are being sent forth into the world as people of God in Christ. And so in response to the word proclaimed today, if you would profess your faith in Christ, if you would not, would unite with his church family, we would welcome you this morning. The next step cards are there. That's an aid, a tool. Maybe you're thinking about it, praying about it, pondering it, and God will prompt you to take those next steps, whatever they may be, this week and beyond. And so may it be so for all of us as we respond to the Word of God. Let's stand as we sing together. Our chorus is here in the bulletin. What does the Lord require of you to live as godly people? What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? I want to know, I want to know. What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? I want to know, I want to know. Justice, kindness, walk humbly with your God. 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 It's my pleasure this morning. I'm sure you probably already know her. Uh, this is Barbara Zimmerman. Here comes Dad, Jack. I'm going to hug him. Our district superintendent, Donna, is here. I'm going to hug her, too, when she gets here. Come here, Donna. <laughs> this is a very special day. Barbara has been part of our church family for some time, but today she formally uh, joins uh, this family of faith and has decided to live out her discipleship here. We are so pleased and so blessed to have you with us. God bless her. She is the district secretary. She gets... <laughs> She gets a special anointing from God for doing that. But Donna, thank you for being here today. So she's been baptized. She's professed her faith. And so we welcome her this morning. And we ask of her to take the vow that all people take as we join the church. It's the guidance for our discipleship here. Will you fulfill your discipleship here through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? God bless you, Barbara. Welcome. We're so happy that you're here. Thank you for sharing as a family of God this moment. And, you know, God has guided our steps in so many ways. And God always gives us opportunities to step into a new day. And today is a new beginning. And so we welcome you, Barbara. And may it be a new beginning for all of us. Receive now the benediction. And now walk as those who have heard the voice, the calling, the word of God. 
And as you make each step along the path that God sets before you, may you hear that voice. May you be illumined by God's wisdom and grace and truth, especially as it was and is embodied by Christ and His church. And may you truly be those through whom others see the inhabitation, the home of God with us. For this we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go now in peace. Amen.